Hi, my name is Laurie Muldowney, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Scientific Investigations within FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about bioresearch monitoring and specifically about good clinical practice inspections. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. So I'm going to cover several topics this afternoon. I'll first provide you with an overview of CEDARS bioresearch monitoring program including its objectives, as well as the role of the BIMO program and BIMO inspections in drug development. I'll then walk through the inspection process, starting with how we choose sites to inspect and through the issuance of post-inspectional correspondence. I'll then touch a little bit on COVID-19, both the role of OSI in the public health emergency, as well as the impact the pandemic has had on BIMO inspections. So the learning objectives today are one, to understand the objectives of FDA, FDA's bioresearch monitoring program. Two, to list three potential outcomes from a good clinical practice inspection. And three, to identify an alternative approach to on-site inspections being used to inform decisions regarding pending applications during the COVID-19 public health emergency. The Bioresearch Monitoring Program, or BIMO for short, is an FDA-wide program of on-site inspections and data audits. It's intended to monitor all aspects of the conduct and reporting of FDA-regulated research. So BIMO inspections are conducted to assess compliance with FDA regulations that govern the conduct of clinical and non-clinical trials. The oversight is intended to ensure that Trials are being conducted in a way that ensures the reliability of the data, and this is particularly important for trials that are used for regulatory decision making, and that also ensures that the rights of subjects in FDA regulated research are being protected. In addition to monitoring clinical and non-clinical study conduct, the BIMO program also has oversight for ensuring compliance with certain post-marketing requirements. This includes adverse event reporting, as well as risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, or REMS, compliance. I'm gonna focus primarily on the BIMO program's role in monitoring clinical trial conduct today, and in ensuring that clinical trials are conducted according to GCP, or good clinical practice principles. And I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on this topic in just a few minutes. So this slide shows the governing framework under which we do our work. I mentioned that during BIMO inspections, we're assessing compliance with the regulations. So at the top of this pyramid are the laws and the regulations that we're responsible for ensuring compliance with. So observations of non-compliance with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, or with sections of Title 21 of the CFR, would be considered regulatory violations. These are enforceable, and they can lead to actions like warning letters. Laws and regulations, however, are drafted broadly in order to meet the demands of different development programs. So guidances, which are at the bottom of this, of this pyramid, allow us to provide more targeted recommendations in specific areas, and they can be much more specific about our current thinking than regulations. So when we think about clinical trial conduct and which studies and which clinical trial sites conducting those studies, are producing data that we can rely on to determine if a drug is effective, we need to think beyond just regulatory compliance. We should also be thinking about the important information and recommendations in FDA. This slide lists the specific regulations that are most relevant to GCP. So these are the regulations that are cited in communications from the FDA when specific regulatory deficiencies are observed during a GCP inspection. So if we issue a warning letter to a sponsor or clinical investigator or an institutional review board, it will be related to non-compliance with one of these regulations that are listed here. I've mentioned good clinical practice or GCP a couple times, and hopefully you're familiar with the term, but good clinical practice is the standard for the design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials that provides assurance that the data and reported results are credible and accurate and that the rights, integrity, and confidentiality of trial subjects are being protected. 
So you can see when we talk about the objectives of the BIMO program being about ensuring the reliability of the data and that the rights of subjects are protected, this is really getting at ensuring that the studies are conducted according to the principles of good clinical practice. So this slide has sort of a screenshot of ICH E6R2. And E6R2 is a fundamental good clinical practice guidance that provides our current thinking and recommendations on GCP. E6R2 discusses topics that are also addressed in the regulations related to GCP that I referenced on the previous slide. And it also touches on some topics that aren't explicitly or specifically covered in the regulations. So for example, E6R2 discusses things like risk-based monitoring and the idea of focusing on critical study elements. And this isn't explicitly discussed in the regulations. So what GCP inspections are conducted under the BIMO program? Inspections of clinical investigators, of sponsors, sponsor investigators, contract research organizations or CROs, and institutional review boards are all considered GCP focused inspections. There's a link at the bottom of this slide to the FDA.gov webpage that provides the compliance program manuals or CPs for each of these inspection types. The CP really is intended to provide instructions for FDA personnel, specifically our colleagues from the Office of Regulatory Affairs, for conducting um, their inspectional activities to evaluate compliance. So P CPs were developed to provide uniform guidance and instructions for the conduct of inspections. So if you're interested in understanding specifically what will be assessed during a clinical investigator inspection, for example, the CP for clinical investigators is publicly available and it provides this information. In addition to these GCP inspections, the BIMO program also has CPs for post-marketing adverse event reporting, REMS reporting, non-clinical lab inspections, and bioavailability and bioequivalent study inspections. All right, so that was our BIMO overview, and now I'm gonna walk through the inspectional process with you from the selection of who to inspect to the issuance of post-inspectional correspondence. So this slide provides an overview of the GCP inspection process, and I'm gonna start at the top and we're gonna go clockwise. You'll see this slide a few times, but we'll start with the risk-based selection of inspection sites. So what triggers a GCP inspection? There are really three pathways that could lead to a GCP inspection. The first is a data validation inspection, which is done as part of a marketing application review. So when an NDA or BLA or certain efficacy supplements for NDAs or BLAs are submitted to the FDA, part of the application review includes an assessment of whether the clinical trial data are acceptable or reliable for use in the review. So oftentimes this assessment will include conducting inspections to assess the clinical trial conduct and verify the data. Our office has a good clinical practice assessment branch who work closely with our Office of New Drugs to select and handle these inspections. And many of our clinical investigator or CI and sponsor CRO inspections are done as part of a marketing application review. I'll give you some more details on the next slide on how we select clinical investigator sites specifically to inspect in this context. We also conduct four cause inspections, which are those that are trigger triggered from a referral or from a complaint from any number of sources. So our good clinical practice compliant, compliance oversight branch receives and reviews, reviews these complaints and determines whether there's a need for what we call a four cause inspection. Complaints or referrals can come from a variety of sources. Uh, they can come from anonymous citizens, study staff, or whistleblowers. They can come from participants in clinical trials. Often we will get these from institutional review boards or from sponsors reporting on their clinical investigators who have um, not been following protocol. Uh, we can also receive these from monitors and also from our colleagues in the Office of New Drugs. So these complaints can come from a variety of sources, and then again, we'll determine whether or not a four cause inspection is warranted. And finally, we conduct routine surveillance inspections of institutional review boards. So that would be another trigger for a GCP inspection of IRBs specifically. 
And as a as an FYI, I guess this is also how we select many of our sites for our pharmacovigilance program, so our post marketing adverse drug experience and our REMS programs. So we use a number of criteria to risk stratify IRBs and develop a prioritized list each fiscal year um, for our, our colleagues in ORA to conduct inspections under this surveillance program. So those are sort of the three avenues by which someone might get a GCP inspection. As you know, clinical trials used for regulatory decision making are typically multinational and can have many clinical trial sites. It would be impossible for the agency to inspect all of those sites during a review cycle. So we use a risk-based approach to selecting sites for inspection. When possible, we use a tool that we call SIS, the CI Site Selection Tool, that calculates a to total risk score for the CI sites based on a variety of factors such as the enrollment at the site, the site-specific efficacy, and the number of complaints. This tool really allows us to use a consistent science-based approach to the selection of clinical sites for inspection. And typically, as part of an NDA or BLA review, we'll inspect two to five clinical investigator sites per application. We may also inspect the sponsor and or the CRO, of course. Once OSI has selected a site or sites for inspection, we prepare an assignment memo and background package for our Office of Regulatory Affairs or ORA colleagues who conduct the inspection. The assignment memo includes any specific data that we would like verified, as well as any other specific instructions beyond what's included in the CP. ORA then conducts the inspection and an OSI reviewer may attend the inspection as a subject matter expert or would provide support for the inspection remotely. So once an assignment is scheduled by ORA, the investigator will call the site to pre-announce the inspection. And this is usually done about three to five days in advance. This is intended to allow the study site time to make sure that the required records are available and that staff can be prepared. Sometimes we're inspecting studies that finished several years prior, so it can take a little bit of time to get everything in order. When the investigator arrives, he or she will provide credentials and a Form 482, which is the notice of inspection, and that's what the picture on the slide, which is difficult to see, is intended to show. So what do investigators look at, at a G on a GCP inspection? I think first, for a CI inspection in particular, they're evaluating whether the study was conducted according to the protocol. So looking at the protocol inclusion exclusion criteria, for example, and comparing that with who was actually enrolled in the study. They're also looking at whether or not the study complied with the regulations. So did the IRB approve the study and what are the communications from the IRB? Were the informed consent procedures followed and are there financial disclosures available? We also want to verify some of the data that would to compare the source documents at the site with the data that was submitted by the sponsor in the marketing application. Really here we're looking at key data, primary endpoint data, important adverse event data, for example. So those are some of the things that are evaluated on inspection. When the investigator is completing the inspection, there will be a closeout meeting at which point the ORA investigator will be able to describe and discuss any observations that they made during the course of the inspection. The ORA investigator will also typically be communicating with the staff throughout the course of the inspection to provide the site with an opportunity to clarify observations while the investigator is still there. But there's always time at the end during the closeout to discuss specific observations. So again, at the conclusion, um, ORA is going to document any observations that they believe to be deviations from the regulations on what we call an FDA Form 483. I believe it's called the Inspectional Observations Form. The 483 doesn't represent a final FDA determination, but if there is a 483 provided at closeout, it would be provided to the highest management official available, and then the observations will be discussed. If you receive a 483 at the conclusion of an inspection, you have 15 business days after the close of the inspection to respond in, to the agency in writing to any observations that were found during the inspection. So if you receive a 483 from the FDA at the completion of an inspection, what should you do? 
The 483 and any written response to a 483 are important items that we review when we're considering the final classification of an inspection and what action to take. So responding to a 483 in writing provides you with the opportunity to explain the issues from your perspective, and it provides us with the information that we can use to make an informed decision. There's no regulatory requirement to respond to a 483, but a well-reasoned, complete, and timely 483 response is really in your best interest. And it could make a difference in the type of regulatory correspondence that's issued. So whether we issue an untitled letter versus a warning letter, for example, and I'll talk a little bit more about those letters in a few minutes. So following the completion of the inspection, the ORA investigator will write up an Establishment Inspection Report, or EIR, as well as provide an initial field classification for the inspection to OSI. OSI will then determine a final classification for the inspection based on the EIR, any evidence or exhibits that are collected by the investigator, the 483, if applicable, and the site's response to the 483, as I mentioned in the last slide, if one was provided. So what are the three potential compliance classifications for an inspected entity? An inspection can be classified as NAI, or no action indicated, VAI, voluntary action indicated, or OAI, official action indicated. As I just mentioned in the last slide, the center decides the final classification for BIMO inspections based on the inspectional findings from the EIR, the 483, the response to the 483, and any exhibits or evidence that are provided. A classification of OAI is indicated if regulatory violations are observed that are repeated, deliberate, and or they involve the submission of false information to the FDA or sponsor, or if regulatory violations are observed that are significant and, and or serious and numerous, and the scope, severity, and pattern of the violations support a finding that either subjects were or would be exposed to an unreasonable and significant risk, or that their rights have been strongly compromised, and or that data integrity has been compromised for key data. So thinking back to how one might respond to a 483 in writing to the FDA, providing us with data to support that any observations on the 482 would not have exposed patients to an unreasonable risk as a result of the violation, or that the violation would not compromise data integrity related to key data, so primary or key secondary endpoints, would be really important. So once OSA makes a final decision on classification, we generate post-inspectional correspondence to the inspected entities. This could be a letter stating that basic compliance with the regulations was observed, or for sites that are classified as OAI, it may be an untitled or a warning letter citing the observations and requesting corrective actions. In addition to communicating with the inspected entity, OSI provides recommendations to the review division on the acceptability of clinical trial data in a, that we, in a marketing application. We do this in a clinical inspection summary, or CIS, and these recommendations are based on the findings from all of the inspections completed in support of a marketing application. In some cases, the CIS might indicate that the conduct was acceptable at the sites inspected and the data appears reliable, and in other cases, it might recommend the conduct of a sensitivity analysis to ex excluding a specific site where there is problematic data or problematic conduct. So this slide lists various actions which may occur as a result of inspection findings. The top are really the most severe, a NIDPO or Notice of Initiation of Disqualification Proceedings, an opportunity to explain, kind of a mouthful, an NOOH or Notice for Opportunity for a Hearing are really the first steps towards disqualifying a clinical investigator from conducting future studies. If we believe there were repeated or deliberate violations of the regs or intentional falsification, Separate from those disqualification proceedings, um, we can refer investigators to our Office of Criminal Investigations if we believe that there is potential for criminal charges based on knowingly or willfully violating the regulations or statutes. Warning letters and untitled letters are considered advisory actions, and these are intended to provide establishments with the opportunity to come into voluntary compliance. 
Warning letters are posted publicly, whereas untitled letters are not. And an untitled letter really cites violations that do not meet the threshold of regulatory significance for a warning letter. The last two, data rejection and clinical hold, are really regulatory review actions. So recommendations from our office to our colleagues in OND, as I mentioned, regarding data reliability could result in data rejection or excluding particular, particular sites from a final analysis and an application. Findings from a four-cause inspection of an ongoing study can, can result in a clinical hold if the findings are concerning. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about the impact of COVID on our office's activities. So travel restrictions, as well as concerns about the safety of OR investigators and study staff personnel as well, as you can imagine, greatly reduced the ability to conduct on-site inspections during COVID over the last, gosh, 16 months now. Travel is starting to open up, but I did want to share with you the approach that has been taken for BIMO inspectional activities during the pandemic. So first, ORA did con continue to conduct certain mission critical inspections on site during the pandemic, and this was really done on a case by case basis. For non mission critical work, ORA used a COVID-19 advisory rating system to determine whether an on site inspection could occur. So this system assesses cases and different COVID cases in different geographic locations in the US and provides color codes of red, yellow, and green based on certain COVID related metrics. So if an area was green or yellow and there was an ORA investigator in that same geographic area or immediately next to that geographic area, then non-mission critical inspections may be able to be conducted over the last year. And this was actually really useful for the BIMO program in particular, because as I mentioned, there are many, many clinical investigator sites. So there are thousands of clinical investigators all over the country. And we're typically conducting more than one inspection per application. So we were able to use this geographic dispersion to our advantage, and ORA was able to continue to conduct a number of on-site inspections as areas of the country would open up. In addition to on-site inspections, other pathways have been used to inform decisions about pending applications. We share inspectional information, for example, with our foreign regulatory counterparts in Health Canada, EMA, MHRA, and so on and so forth. We also have other approaches that I'll touch on in a second. And finally, we are prioritizing postponed inspections. So this is primarily our approach to surveillance inspections, and those will be completed as travel restrictions are lifted. So remote interactive evaluations. Um, in order to support regulatory decision-making and continue some form of oversight during the protracted travel, travel restrictions related to COVID, FDA has been developing remote approaches to assessing establishments, including clinical trial sites and sponsors. We issued a guidance in April that provides an overview of what are called remote interactive evaluations, or RIEs. RIEs are voluntary and they may include a remote review of documents and other records, either using a cloud-based platform to share documents or through screen sharing or through a direct read-only access to electronic systems. An RIE might also include the use, of, the use of live streaming of the facilities. This is really critical for manufacturing inspections where a big part of on-site inspections includes the assessment of the actual manufacturing process. For many BIMO inspections, we're typically reviewing source records, SOPs, and other essential documents to the conduct of the clinical trial. So live streaming becomes less important. For any of these RIEs, however, regular video and teleconferencing throughout the conduct of the evaluation is still critical to address questions or concerns throughout the RIE. In RIE, um, there can be a variety of outcomes from an RIE. Um, it can allow us to confirm the reliability of clinical trial data submitted in a marketing application. So that can help to support FDA's assessment of a pending application. RIEs also can inform the timing for future inspections. We don't currently classify RIEs as we do inspections. So there's no NAI, VAI, or OAI classification. 
However, findings from an RIE can lead to, to regulatory meetings or to sending advisory letters, such as warning letters or untitled letters. I'm going to go quickly through the next two slides because I believe they were already covered by a colleague. But I just want to stress that the FDA recognizes that COVID impacted and continues to impact the conduct of clinical trials. We have received many, many questions from a variety of sources and developed guidance to try and address some of the more common issues and questions. The FDA guidance on the conduct of clinical trials of medical products during COVID-19 public health emergency first published in March of 2020 and has been updated multiple times with question and answer appendices to address frequently asked questions from the public. The guidance stresses that ensuring the safety of trial participants is most important, but how to best do that is really going to depend on a lot of things, including the indication that's being studied, as well as the nature of the investigational product. The guidance reminds people to engage with IRBs as early as possible and that documentation is key. For example, document in the CRF when data is missing due to COVID, document in the study report, the nature, extent, and impact of COVID on the conduct of the trial. These are just sort of a couple of examples. And finally, optimize the use of central and remote monitoring programs to maintain oversight of clinical trials, something that we actually recommend in general practice, but particularly during COVID. One final reminder, I just want to mention related to clinical studies and COVID. Um, research studies that involve human participants must generally be conducted under an IND. Studies of marketed drug products can sometimes be exempt if they meet certain criteria, but often an IND is required. CETA reviews INDs to assure that the rights and safety of participants are protected and that the study design is adequate and will allow an evaluation of the drug safety and effectiveness. So clinical investigations of drugs for the prevention or treatment of COVID are no different than other clinical investigations and they would generally require an IND. If there's any questions about the applicability of the IND regulations to a proposed study, you should seek advice from the relevant review division. This is a common violation cited in FDA warning letters to sponsor investigators. So that's it really. In summary, FDA's bioresearch monitoring program monitors all aspects of the conduct and reporting of FDA-regulated research to ensure that trials are being conducted in a way that ensures the reliability of the data and that the rights of participants are being protected. Inspections are an important component of the BIMO program. FDA continues to have oversight of clinical trial conduct during the public health emergency, both through on-site inspections and through alternative approaches. And FDA recognizes that COVID has had a significant impact on the conduct of clinical trials. Stakeholders should review the guidance that I mentioned um, in a previous slide. And clinical investigators of drugs must generally, clinical investigations, sorry, of drugs must generally be conducted under an IND, including studies for the prevention and or treatment of COVID. So I have a couple challenge questions for you. The first, if you receive an FDA Form 483 at the closeout of an inspection, you have how many business days to provide a written response? Seven days, 15 days, 30 days, or there is no timeline to respond to an FDA Form 483? And the correct answer is B, 15 days. A Form 483 is a list of inspectional observations that the ORA investigator believes are deviations from the regulations. They're not a final agency determination, and the inspected entity has 15 days to provide a written response to the agency. So the second challenge question is, which type, types of inspections are not covered in the BIMO program? Clinical investigator, sponsor, and CROs drug manufacturing inspections, post-marketing adverse event reporting, and REMS inspections, or D, institutional review boards. I did that fairly quickly, but I think that was an easy one. The answer is B, drug manufacturing inspections are not considered part of the BIMO program. So I think that is it. Um, thank you for your time. I think I went a few minutes over. I apologize. Thanks so much.
thank you, Dr. Muldowney. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and and give so much insight on a lot of these topics. And we are going to go ahead and take some questions from the audience. It looks like you have a lot here. So we'll just go ahead and start right now if you're ready. So your first question is, are GCP regulations identical to those applicable in biologics and veterinary technologies? Hi, thank you. Um, sure. So uh, the GCP regulations, if, if the biologic is being regulated as a drug, which many biologics are, then those would be um, identical. There are unique regulations that apply only to biologics and unique regulations, um, you know, that that for especially for blood products or other certain types of biologics. Um, I would say that veterinary um, the uh, GCP applies really to human studies. So there's GLP, good laboratory practices, um, which would apply to some of the veterinary studies. Um, but in general, for biologics and drugs, many of the regulations are the same. Okay, great. Thanks for taking that question. We have another one for you. What are your expectations in terms of documentation related to the impact of COVID-19 at clinical investigation sites? Sure. Um, well, I would say first and foremost, sponsors and clinical investigators should document how the restrictions related to COVID-19 um, led to changes in study conduct and the duration of those changes during their trial. Um, you should indicate which trial participants were impacted and, and how they were impacted. Um, you know, we, we understand that there were changes in study visit schedules, um, significant changes, a lot of mix, missed visits and patient discontinuations, um, that there, the amount of missing data will be um, substantially larger um, due, due to COVID travel restrictions and other challenges during COVID. But it, we would say it's also important to try to capture specific information in the case report form that explains the basis of missing data, um, including the relationship to COVID, um, for missing protocol specified information. And this information should also be summarized in the clinical study report would be very helpful um, to the agency. Great, thank you so much for taking that question as well. And we have another question. Can you please highlight whether there is increased collaboration with international health authorities due to COVID-19? And in addition, what does the FDA base its decisions on if they're looking at other authority inspection outcomes? Sure, that's a great question. And we actually um, collaborate regularly, even prior to COVID, um, with our foreign regulatory counterparts. Now, I will say that the regulations aren't the same. You know, there's obviously significant overlap in the intent of the regulations. Um, and the ICH documents really reflect um, what are the regulatory requirements uh, for many of our foreign regulatory counterparts. Um, that being said, um, we can really rely on information that we receive from our foreign regulatory counterparts to inform our marketing application review. So um, we may get information that is um, that helps uh, helps us to um, feel comfortable with the reliability of the data and the clinical trial conduct in general. So we don't use it. Um, some of our other um, some of the drug manufacturing they have some different agreements with foreign regulatory counterparts in order to be able to sort of directly use inspectional findings. We don't have that same um, approach for BIMO for the reasons that I just mentioned, because the regulations are different. There are differences to the regulations, but we certainly um, use information. Um, we have cooperative agreements. We t speak regularly with MHRA and EMA and our other foreign regulatory counterparts, and we do use that information. I would say during COVID, we've been obviously doing that more because of our inability to travel. So um, we have routine meetings and we try to identify common, um, you know, common applications and where we can learn from each other and we can get information um, during times when it's difficult to do so. Great. Thank you so much. That's a great, great insight. So, 
So with that, we have another question for you. If someone is submitting documents related to a BIMO positive collection, which in, in some of the documents include clinical study level information, subject level data line listings by clinical site, and summary level of clinical data site data sets, are those also mandatory if they are submitting an original BLA or NDA? Can you hear me now? I'm having a few technical glitches. Can, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Well. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Yep. I, uh, I'm having, I, I, I apologize. I'm having a glitch every few minutes. It just lasts for a few seconds. So I apologize. I had a, a glitch at a bad time. Um, so I think you were referring to the BIMO data sets that we use to use our clinical investigation investigator site selection tool. So these are sort of site specific data sets that we receive that allow us to use this tool to risk stratify the clinical investigator sites and choose sites to inspect as part of a marketing application review. Those are not currently man mandatory. Um, the guidance is in draft that describes those data sets. Um, uh, they will someday because there are regulations that these this guidance um, uh, follows, but it, not until that guidance is finalized. And then I don't remember what the grace period is, but there's a sort of a specified grace period um, that is given before those data sets would be required. So at this point, they're not required. They are not mandatory. We do appreciate when we get them. We are seeing a huge uptick in the um, frequency that we receive those data sets. And, you know, I think the benefits to industry is it actually really sort of cuts down on our time um, to make those decisions on sites to inspect. There's a lot of logistics that go, uh, particularly if we have to go overseas, there's a lot of logistics um, related to planning inspections. So if we can make those decisions really quickly, sort of before even, you know, before the filing meeting timeframe in the in the review clock, then that I, I think benefits everybody because if we find anything of concern, then we can sort of identify that earlier and not at the 11th hour. Um, so not currently mandatory, but appreciated someday mandatory. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And we have another question about BIMO inspections. If these inspections outside the U.S. have been postponed during the pandemic, when would this resume? Will NDA and PDUFA dates affected, will they affect NDAs that rely on clinical trials performed outside the U.S.? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll touch on domestic first, just um, because as of July 1st, um, they resumed sort of normal operations for domestic inspections. So that's a huge win. Um, from a foreign perspective, um, you know, it is it is challenging and it's very de it's very dependent on the country and things are changing every um, every day, every week. Um, so we don't know when we will be resuming normal, and I'm using air quotes here, but when we would be resu resuming normal and foreign inspections. Um, in the meantime, we are trying to use other approaches to get information from foreign, um, when, when we do have foreign sites, foreign inspections, or for, I'm sorry, for a marketing application. And, you know, that would include, as I mentioned before, the, or as was, I think, stated in my presentation, the remote interactive evaluations. Um, we have used those largely for foreign sites, and in particular for marketing applications that only include foreign sites um, for their studies. We also, when we are able, can rely on foreign regulatory counterparts. And if we feel confident that we've gotten sufficient information from um, our foreign regulatory counterparts, then that is another way that we can get around that. Um, you know, we really, at this point, we've been doing everything that we can to not have to um, delay uh, any marketing application because of BIMO inspections. And we've been very fortunate in being able to to sort of work around it. Um, so, you know, more to come, uh, you know, I think everybody's looking for a crystal ball on when things will be able to go back um, and it's, it's hard to say. Great, thanks. Yeah, that very uncertain time. So we have many more questions for you. Um, our next one is, 
What happens if a sponsor does not respond to a 483 within 15 days? If the sponsor needs more time to respond to the 43 observations, what should they do? So there is no requirement, as, as was stated, to respond to a 483. Um, that being said, we have a pretty, you know, um, firm deadline on 15 days. So if, uh, if somebody is interested in providing um, more context or information to us, um, then it's really um, important to meet that 15 day deadline. Okay, great. So they don't have extensions or anything like that? No, we do not have any formal extensions. Okay, great. All right, our next question is, would the FDA routinely inspect IND and IDE exempt studies or research, IND, IDEs, without cause? Um, so that's a good question. No, I mean, as I mentioned, there are a few pathways um, for which we would conduct a GCP inspection. Um, and for like a clinical investigator site, that's really largely as part of a marketing application review, or it would be for cause inspection. So if it's not conducted under an IND, really, we're going to be doing that inspection as a, as a for cause. So if we receive a referral or we receive a complaint, um, and that complaint is evaluated and it is felt that an inspection is warranted, um, then we may still do that. And that would be the pathway for those types of inspections. Great, thank you, Dr. Maldoni. And another question. Could you explain when a 43 may translate into a VAI versus an OAI, a voluntary action indicated or an official action indicated? Sure. Um, so. A a 483, and I'm glad that, that I have this question because I, I hate listening to myself speak, and I realized at one point I think I called it a 482, but hopefully you all know that that was just a verbal gaffe. Um, it, a 483 is issued when the ORA investigator believes that they've observed conditions that in their judgment may constitute violations from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and from related acts and regulations. Um, so it doesn't necessarily correlate to a specific to a specific classification. You know, there's a field classification that is given by ORA when that inspection is initially conducted. Um, but staff from Office of Compliance, from the Office of Scientific Investigations, we will review those observations on the 483 along with any evidence that was collected, any exhibits that were collected during the inspection, any response to the 483 from the um, in inspected entity, as well as the EIR, and we will then determine the final classification. So really a decision about OAI versus VAI, um, and sometimes there are 483s that actually end up as an NAI. Um, but I think, you know, so if you're talking really between an, an OAI and a VAI, it's gonna really be dependent on the scope and significance of that observation. So if that observation, if we believe um, whatever that violation was, had a direct impact, a negative impact on the integrity of the primary efficacy data or a significant safety risk for participants, then those are gonna be sort of in that OAI bucket for a warning letter or an untitled letter. Um, a VAI would be if that observation, if we believe that the scope and significance of the violation don't warrant an OAI. So that decision is gonna be made um, ultimately by CEDAR, by our center. Great, thank you, Dr. Maldoni. And we have another question that's sort of similar to this and if it's the same, you know, it's up to you if you wanna expand on it, but they ask what are, com what are the, some of the most common findings that would lead to an investigator, a clinical investigator receiving a warning letter. Sure, um, I'd say that um, by far the most common finding for a CI is failure to follow the investigational plan. Um, so big part of our inspection is comparing what was done at the site with what's, what's, what is described in the protocol. Um, and other common findings might be inadequate study records, inadequate accountability or control of investigational product, um, and informed consent violations. So those are sort of the big ones. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question on a different topic. Are there different considerations for a sponsor or clinical investigator when conducting a decentralized clinical trial? Sure, this is a huge question and could be kind of a full day workshop, I think. Um, and I think John talked about um, uh, DCTs earlier, but I'll try to cover, cover a couple things. I mean, you know, decentralized clinical trials are increasingly popular. Um, they, during COVID, due to travel restrictions and other challenges, they became even, even more broadly used. And, um, you know, and they can really vary from a fully decentralized clinical trial to a trial that's pretty, um, that may only have a few decentralized elements. But regardless, um, the investigator and sponsor responsibilities don't change. Um, I will say that because the data flow can be more complicated in a decentralized trial, um, the sponsor really should have a detailed understanding of the data flow and a robust and well-defined collect data collection, data handling, and data management procedures. You know, technical support and training of study staff and participants can be more important, particularly with the use of a variety of digital technology, digital technologies. And for investigators, um, you know, they're still responsible for the management of the source documents, even though they may not all originate from the site. So they should have the appropriate processes and procedures in place for the maintenance and retention of, of source documents. Great, thank you. Very helpful. And we have a, a question about remote monitoring. If a company has used remote monitoring to oversee study conduct, including remote source data verification during the COVID-19 public health emergency, does the FDA expect that the company will need to re-verify the data by an on-site monitoring visit once the pandemic restrictions are lifted? So we've actually had this question a number of times through, you know, like our through the clinical trial conduct mailbox and other places. And and no, really, the FDA regulations don't require remonitoring of remotely monitored data. Um, so, you know, the monitoring methods that a sponsor chooses should just ensure the proper conduct of the investigation, the integrity of the data, and that the right safety and welfare of the patients, uh, the trial participants are protected. And, you know, we always, um, so the methods should always be proportionate to the risks related to the trial and the importance of the information collected. There is no requirement to re-monitor um, to re-monitor anything that was remotely monitored unless the sponsor's sort of risk evaluation determines that they feel that they should do that. Okay, great. Thank you. And there's a related question as well. Will the remote evaluations continue to be used after COVID? Yeah, so this is sort of um, the million dollar question, the remote interactive evaluations. Um, you know, I, and I would say, I, I wish I had a crystal ball on where we'll be in the future. I think the best that I can say is that we're continuing to explore and evaluate the use of really all of the alternative tools and remote interactive evaluations in particular, including outside of the public health emergency. Um, we've actually used remote evaluations prior to the pandemic. For example, if we had a study conducted in an area where it was unsafe to travel, for example, due to political unrest, we may sometimes have records shipped to a domestic site where they can be evaluated or use virtual methods to review records um, in a cloud-based environment. Um, COVID obviously required that we really increase our use of remote approaches. And I think we all see the value in continuing to explore them. We also have to balance that with the value of having boots on the ground to conduct an inspection. Um, and this is really, particularly important for certain types of inspections, manufacturing inspections, analytical bioequivalence inspections, where we're actually evaluating an ongoing process. Um, for many BIMO inspections, we're inspecting a study that may already be complete, 
particularly for marketing applications. That study could have been completed you know, six months to five years ago, depending on the study. Um, so much of the inspection is related to evaluating written procedures, documentation, audit trails, and source records. And so I think our goal is really to try and, you know, continue to, de to, to develop these tools and see how they can best be used in the, in the future. I sort of like to think that we'll end up in a future state that we have multiple tools in our toolbox, um, from on-site inspections to remote evaluations or record requests. And, depending on the establishment, the study, and potentially the question that we're trying to answer, we may use a different tool. But, you know, I think that that's my, that, that's my future imagination, perhaps. You know, I think we're continuing to explore and, um, and figure out how best these tools should be used in the future. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more. If a clinical investigator site is found as an OAI, can data from that site be used in a marketing application? So I guess I think the short answer is it depends. Um, so I mentioned in my presentation that when we conduct inspections to evaluate sites in support of marketing applications, we really have two reasons for inspecting them that are related but not exactly the same. So we're first assessing the site for regulatory compliance, and that will determine the final classification that a site receives, as well as whether they receive an advisory letter, such as a warning letter and an, or an untitled letter. We also review the inspectional findings from multiple CI sites, as well as sometimes a sponsor and or a CRO, to evaluate the overall study conduct of a clinical trial being used to support a product approver, approval. And we provide a recommendation on the reliability of the data for use in a marketing application based on those inspections. If a site was found OAI and received a warning letter, let's say for failure to study, follow the study protocol, and that failure directly impacted key study data, um, you know, we would generally recommend that that site data be excluded from the efficacy analysis or that a sensitivity or that a sensitivity analysis be conducted to ensure that the drug is still shown to be effective without the data from that site. Um, sometimes, however, the finding could be related to something that might not have directly impacted what the, the integrity of the data, and we may feel comfortable including that data in the efficacy and safety analysis. Sort of on the other side of the coin, there are times that we have study sites that are found to be VAI or even sometimes NAI, but where there were observations made that lead to concerns about the data integrity that might lead us to a recommendation to our colleagues in the Office of New Drugs, again, to conduct a sensitivity analysis to ensure that that drug would still be shown to be effective um, even without that site data. So, um, so it really, really sort of depends. So I, I ended with a very um, nebulous answer, <laughs> apologize. Okay, well, if you want, we could, do you have time for one more question, Lori? Sure, I have time for one more. I thought you said that was the end, but I'm happy to answer <laughs> one more. Well then we'll, we'll end with one that isn't nebulous. How about that? So. Um, if you want to take a look, there's a few more that came in, um, and we just want to say thank you to our audience, if, or if you want to take a look, but we want to say thank you to our audience for submitting so many great questions on on this topic, and and we want to thank Dr. Maldoni for, for answering them, but if there's one you want to answer, how about... Lisa, I'm sorry, but my Google, my Google form isn't showing up anymore so if you can just oh, roll yeah, the dice yeah, that's all right <laughs> sure okay well i think we ended on a great note that you extended on so many of these questions we're so appreciative and you give such long um helpful answers that that i think our audience is walking away very happy so again thank you for your time dr Maldoni. and we with that we'll transfer it to dr to brenda stoddard and she will